Welcome everyone. We're excited to have you. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Jen. How's Chicago? Cold. Still cold. <laughs> <laughs> Same here in DC, although things are heating up issue wise, but definitely a little chilly as you can see from my black uh, attire, although you're at least nice and spring-like. I appreciate I try, that. I try. In my mind, it's spring. <laughs> so, well, we're really excited today to host the April um, Lady to Lunch Nuggets for um, Telecom and Tech, and we're thrilled to have Tim McDonald. Tim, um, I'm going to let you go through your background, but just um, I'm going to put a plug in for Tim's LinkedIn follow. He's a uh, a great person to follow on LinkedIn for lessons on all sorts of things, including many good perspectives that I try to teach my children. So Tim, <laughs> uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I originally met Tim as a client in New York and he's been a, become more than a professional colleague, but a friend. So Tim, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. You, you, I was enjoying like the little banter back and forth. You guys have a like, you know, you you got a you got a longer form program. Uh, you know, in, in the works <laughs> after this thing, it's 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 amazing. And you know, Jennifer, it's funny you you, you make the comment about the, the the LinkedIn and and that it's applicable to your children, which I do I do appreciate and take to heart. Um, I um, you know I've been a and you know sort of posting on and off over the years, and uh, and and I got to just start to sharing um sort of life and professional perspectives um re recently uh and i just do it when something comes to my heart and i put it out there and um <laughs> but a friend of mine from the industry reached out to me a couple of weeks back he's like uh hey um totally love the stuff that you're uh you're posting on linkedin but uh you're not dying are you <laughs> i'm like no no, but you know, like it is a format that you can capture thoughts. Uh, and I do know that at least two of my five children are on LinkedIn. So to a certain extent, maybe they're taking some of those lessons to heart as well. Good. Well, that's great. And what I forgot to mention, of course, for this audience is you're also a Hoya. So uh, Georgetown running through your blood and at least one of the five kids, if I have that right. Oh yeah, no, I am. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a loyal Hoya. So like, yeah, I mean, my, 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 my sort of personal background is, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian with a, with five, five children. Um, you know, I live in New Jersey. I've been married for 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, um, I'm a graduate of Georgetown as is my grandfather and father before me, and then my oldest son. So, you know, Georgetown is, uh, the, the place that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I love that. Um, you know, I, I love George and we were super fortunate to have our oldest uh, attend. Um, it's a it's a great institution. And and I honestly think Jennifer, you know, Carolyn, like I know you want to get into the 5G stuff, but like I, I just think like the the world is at a place now where it, it it's super dynamic and and changing along sort of every dimension uh imaginable. We could talk specifics, but you know, it, it it's a it's a period in the business and policy you know uh, landscape where you need sort of cross disciplinary understanding of what's going on um, because the, the the impacts are not limited to silos uh, as they ha have been in the past. So I, I do think a, an institution like Georgetown, particularly being in D.C., but also having you know the 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 span of of capabilities from the business school to the you know, the foreign service school, the medical school, to the law school, um, to things that are going on, you know, in the in the public policy school and, and you know, at the Center for you know, Security and Emerging Technologies. Like, there's a role to play um, as a convener um, and as a, you know, as, 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 an, as an institution that can help people make sense of what oftentimes seems like a very confusing uh, economic and political landscape. Can I just jump in real quick, just for the benefit of our audience, um, some of whom are not necessarily familiar with sort of the investment world. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what Pennant Capital is all about, just to give them that perspective in terms of where you sit and yeah. the perspective that you have on what we're about to talk about? Yeah, so I, I sit in a super fortunate place um, in the investment landscape. Um, and I've played a lot of different roles over the years, but the, the, the role that I play presently is we're a family office, and that's a term that gets you know sort of broadly 
uh, you know, thrown around out there. You know, it's sort of like generally like somebody's made money and they have enough money that they can actually run their own investment team. Um, we're, we're a single family office for um, a gentleman named Alan Fournier, and he got his start um, working in the hedge fund business. Um, so he ran it into, you know, for about 17 years. He got his start working for a guy named David Tepper, who's well known in the investment community. Um, and then in 2018, he, um, he, he wound down the hedge fund and it turned into a family office. So we have a per it's just a single balance sheet, right? We work personal portfolio. Um, the way we sort of run the, the family office is we have three buckets that we deploy capital to. And our job is really just to, you know, to generate return. We're not, you know, um, we're, we're because we work on behalf of a single family, um, we can take a longer term horizon. Right. Um, we're not matching any indices. We just try to find discontinuities in the market, public and private, and deploy capital against that. Um, so we're an unusual beast in the investment landscape in that we don't have anybody like looking over our shoulder saying, how did you do last quarter? Or right. you're not diversified enough. So so we, we invest um, and we invest um, in public securities, um, generally long and much more concentrated than it would have been as a hedge fund. So meaning we have fewer positions of larger size. Um, we invest in funds. Um, so we invest alongside uh, general partners who are sort of doing differentiated things in the markets who are doing private investing. Um, and then alongside those fund partners, uh, we'll do direct investing, mostly in partnership with, with a GP. So, you know, if we find a, 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 a you know, a, a company that they really like and, you know, they say, hey, look, here's, we're going to do, you know, 10 million for the for the fund and would you guys be interested um, we do that uh, as well so we do we do all three i operate across all three um as a person with gray hair would do now one one important part of your background that i think is also relevant to our topic today that you did not mention is your relationship to what some of us drive on a frequent basis and pay a shit ton of money to is the dallas greenway Please share a little bit of your real yeah, estate no, that, background. That's, a, that's actually it's, it's it's a funny story and an interesting one. Um, so my first, so so my my path. Look, I mean, I, I think I would I wouldn't waste the time here, but like you can look at my LinkedIn profile. Like I've definitely followed the road less traveled, um, and and have done it purposefully and and sort of um, you know always learned a, a, a lot along the way. But um, my first real job in D.C. Um, after spending some time in politics was I worked for a company called the Toll Road Corporation of Virginia. Um, and it was literally a, a startup developing the Dulles Greenway. Um, so I spent three and a half years commuting from Al Alexandria to Leesburg uh, and, you know, was sort of in every part of that project from, you know, securing the public approvals to interfacing with the project financing team at Goldman in New York. Uh, you know, for, for, for a 23, 24, 25 year old kid, it was like phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's the most tangible thing I've ever done. <laughs> You know, you can go down there and be like, that's a road. You it know? is a road. But, you know, and like now you start talking about crypto and you're like, wait a second, didn't you do the road one time? It's so like, what's no, really, really cool um, yeah. for, for those listening and, and watching is the fact that that Greenway, by the way, thank you very much. It saved my, it was the one fun thing I could do during the pandemic when everything was shut down because I would go out to a barn that was, that was at the dead end of the Greenway and there was no other cars and no police. So it was a very fun drag race. <laughs> uh, but that being said, that entire section of Virginia now is overrun with giant database farms, huge, huge, huge database farms, which is in a very roundabout way um, coming full circle to our topic today, which is to talk about this thing called the next industrial revolution. I think some business press label it the fourth industrial revolution um, and where technology fits into that and in particular 5G and the ability of 5G to connect the various clouds that are developing out there, many of which are being informed by those giant, giant buildings along the road you built. And I, we can sort of start off, uh, Jen, if you wanted to kick us off to get into the meat of the conversation, I will go ahead and tag along yeah. and interrupt. I mean, I think that's a great setup, Carolyn. Um, so much of the cloud service providers, CSPs as we call them, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, of course, are getting into the wireless world, although don't own the lifeblood of the wireless infrastructure, that being Spectrum. I guess I'm curious, Tim, as to your view on the landscape right now. 
if you're Verizon and AT&T, are the best days behind you? Um, I mean, I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, you know, the and, the and it goes back, let me just sort of go back to the toll road analogy for a second, because I, I think like um, in life, mental models are really, really important. And and I've been blessed um, to have uh, a, a, a range of different life experiences that provide me a different set of mental models for how I think about how the world is evolving. And uh, and so that toll road experience was like crazy beneficial in a lot of different ways. Um, but one of one of the ways uh, that's relevant to what we're talking about now is is sort of like, you know, it, it, you know what an enabling architecture does for economic development, um, and 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 how like certain things can't happen without other certain things being in place. Um, the guy who I worked for, who's a brilliant entrepreneur who died at a young age, named Ralph Stanley, um, you know, basically had a vision for connecting to develop a connecting roadway that ran through farmland from Dulles Airport out to Leesburg. And, you know, a lot of people at the time, it was Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner, and Bill that they will come, they laughed at. You know, and I've been thinking recently, I was like, you know, I'd really like time-lapse photo of economic development over the last 30 years, and particularly um, internet connectivity over the last 30 years uh, since that roadway went in place. So what does that mean for 5G? It means like the what we've developed over the last um, 30 years, um, you know, starting with the development of the internet, I think is an enabling architecture, which, you know, we kind of refer, refer to around here as kind of the global compute platform. Um, and, you know, we kind of came at it um, with disaggregated pieces um, uh, developed over the year around very specific sort of use cases. Right. So and and Jennifer and you and I have walked through the development of the industry along these lines. But, you know, you know, it started out with simple, simple, very, very simple uh, connectivity. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, I was using a, you know, 14 four baud modem from U.S. Robotics, you know, <laughs> um, to break phone. <laughs> yeah, to, 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 you know, to connect to you know, um, you know, uh, uh, Meritex phone lines in Chicago to give me the squeaky sound so I could get access to this thing they called the internet. Um, and, and so there was, a, there, was a, there was a lot that was happening at the infrastructure level that took place from, you know, from the mid nineties really through, um, you know, probably the you know, 2004, 2005, 2008, it still goes on to a certain extent with cable um, where we upgraded the access infrastructure to enable you to get access to kind of new and improved parts of that squeaky connection of the internet. There was a ton of speculation that was happening at the applications layer. Um, and as happens with technology, people can see the benefits of technology before the ecosystem itself is in place. That's the, you know, people attribute it to, to, you know, to Gates, but it's really Roy Amara, who's a, who's a famous engineer who said, you know, you tend to overestimate the impact of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So, so like what we've seen happen over the last 25, 30 years is we've built this sort of enabling architecture that's really now coming into its fore. So that first wave was, was basic access connectivity, fixed access connectivity. Uh, and it started with DSL and it moved up to the cable guys and really now it's just cable, right? And then you know, and then in 2000... So can I ask you a quick question, Tim? When you say it's just cable, what about fiber? Yeah, I mean, then it, then it became fiber. Then it became okay. fiber. But let me kind of go through this quick. Oh, sure. Sorry. Quicker. I'll try to make it quicker. <laughs> but like fiber is relevant, but fiber is kind of like, you know, um, you know, sort of playing catch up. So then then you had a, a, a wave of, 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 of wireless access. Same kind of thing. Like, let's access this thing we call the Internet through wireless. And, and you know, we kind of, I was involved in Clearwire, Craig McCall, you know, a bunch of, you know, Spectrum, hey, this is not being used, we can pull it together, we're going to create this new competitive, you know, wholesale carrier, Owen, by the way, you know, um, you know, we're going to offer it on a wholesale basis, right, like, you know, brilliant guy, I worked for Craig, I got involved in it before, uh, while I was at Merrill, and then I, I, I ended up working for his family office, and I served on the board of Clearwire, but the idea was like, hey, high capacity infrastructure to get wireless access to the same thing we call the internet. And, and and it started a like you know a, a you know a, 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 a capacity war and and they you know we tried this WiMAX thing you know let Intel's path to 
to wireless. That didn't work out for a whole host of reasons, but you know, it started, a, it started, you know, it jump started LTE, and then we saw connectivity. Okay, so they had this connectivity layer that was built. Okay, then along comes the iPhone, right? So now you have this connectivity layer combined with this access device, right? And and then you had applications layer. So, so that and the applications layers required much more infrastructure in terms of compute, and that goes to the server farm. So now you've got access fixed, access wireless, device infrastructure, compute infrastructure, right? And all of these things are happening at the same time. And, and Jennifer will tell you, like, power infrastructure was developing along the same lines. Okay. So now fast forward to 2022, what do we have? Well, we have this massive now connected 24 seven fixed and wireless compute platform. Okay, you know, it took us 30 years to get here and a lot of fits and starts, but that's what we have today. So like when we talk about the industrial revolution, we talk about the, you know, the role of 5G and stuff, you have to step back and say, you have an enabling architecture here that can fundamentally transform every dimension of society uh, that didn't exist before. It's not what we're talking about. It's like, you know, it, it, you know, it, 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 it took a long time to get here, but we're just scratching the surface with what, what, what it can enable. So, I mean, I would argue, look, I don't think Moderna and Pfizer could have developed the vaccine as quickly as they had without the capabilities of AWS, full yeah. stop. And AWS wouldn't have had the capabilities they've had without like, you know, the YouTubes of the world and everybody else powering the development of, of storage and compute and processing and all of those things that were going on. So like, you know, we're just scratching the surface of what this global compute platform can enable. And I would argue that like, honestly, like the economic impact of what we've done with this architecture is child's play. Cause it's like navel gazing technologies to consume an individual's time, distract them, you get them on TikTok, get them on YouTube, get them on whatever. We're not seeing the benefits of it in, in sort of in industry, which is what I think we'll, we'll we're on the on the cusp of seeing. Anyway, that's a so, that's a lot. Let me no 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 no. Let, let's keep going here. And I just wanted to jump on, kind of go back to Jen, your original question, which is, so in terms of are the the best days behind or ahead of the two largest mobile? Although I think T-Mobile's larger largest right now, based on subscribers, mm -hmm. that their best days are behind them. Everything you talked about seemed to be premised on this dynamic digital mobile infrastructure that's there and continuing to grow. Why is it that you think the best days are behind the companies that are operating those fundamental enabling platforms upon which everything else is being built? I would say, first of all, they're not, they, they, they are operating elements of the, of the, of the platform. Um, but um, I, I, I would, I would say that, um, the the economic model upon which those companies are built, which is extracting egregious rents from consumers for a commodity service, is over. Um, full stop. And that would make Mike Siebert happy. That probably won't make others happy. Mike's a good guy, but like, I'm sorry, but you know, the value that a carrier adds in terms of connectivity is kind of a joke. If you really looked at it and said, hey, how much of the data that I consume happens over my wireless connection versus my Wi-Fi connection? You'd find that it's probably 20% over your wireless connection and 80% over your Wi-Fi connection. So what am I paying when it relative to my overall data use for this carrier connectivity? By the way, I buy an iPhone. I don't buy a Verizon phone or a T-Mobile right. phone. Okay. And what am I using my, my iPhone for? I'm using my iPhone for, 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 for apps. Those apps aren't developed by the carrier. So what do you got? You give me wide area coverage. Great. Love it. Fantastic. That's great. That's what you've done. But your entire economic model is based on getting, you know, high rents for a small slice of the value proposition. If you step back as an analyst, you say, wait a second, like that's not sustainable. It's right. simply not sustainable. So yeah, look, I think their days, their best days are behind them. Uh, it, it is what it is. I mean, we've made money as an investor, um, you know, understanding that we, you know, we were an investor in T-Mobile. Uh, it was great at 75. We were happy to exit, you know, north of 140. I love Mike. I love their <laughs> asset. I know the spectrum. I think it's a great thing. But now, where are we today? Okay, well, where we are today is that we have an infrastructure layer uh, and a compute platform that mm -hmm. is now ubiquitous. And the, the reason for, for accessing said network is is application layer compute. Remember, like the carriers that you just mentioned, their whole 
you know, cause for being was voice connectivity, mm-hmm. right? And How this much- is just bastardization <laughs> of levering that monopoly, right? It's, it's always been the year of, da- of the data, uh, you know, it's yeah, the but, but, year of data for the last 10 years. So, Come on. so I, I know I'm, 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 I'm being a little provocative, but, you know, look, it, it, it's, it, I get it. If one steps back, I say, okay, so here we are in 2022, and uh, I want to be in the wireless business. First of all, I'd say, do I want to be in the retail wireless business or the industrial wireless business? I would argue that machine connectivity is like building a toll road in, you know, Loudoun County in Mm -hmm. 1992 it's like that's greenfield baby like you know the virginia department of transportation is not going after that and they have no incumbent advantage on you right so i'd say like first of all you want to go after the market that's new not the market that's a legacy then if i was going after the legacy market i'd say if i'm going after retail i'm going after their business model Mm -hmm. right and Mm -hmm. and you expect to see you know my friend peter adderton and you know it's my friend steve vocals and 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 all of the others who 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 are going to go after that market and do what they rightly should do which is like you know disintermediate the idea that the carrier has to put the whole burden of connectivity fees on the consumer like that's okay. yes that's and so i'm guessing you're you're, you're not suggest work. you're not suggesting an advertising model so what what what's the what in your view well you i mean it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be an advertising model but but look at it this way like you know um tiktok has a has a way of monetizing customers right doesn't really matter. They just have a way of monetizing customers. So they're happy to pay a carrier Mm -hmm. to enable them to monetize, right? So when you think about it as a value chain, you've got, you've got the application and then you've got the individual, right? You've got, those are the two ends. And then you've got a carrier in between, but the carrier is taxing the individual who the application is monetizing. So TikTok comes to, and they're, they're doing this in Mexico and they'll do it elsewhere. The likes of TikTok can come and say, Hey, Mr. Carrier, I'll pay you 10 bucks a month and give that guy access to connectivity, you know, to enable him, you know, to get access to my apps. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Like, it's perfectly intuitive. Why wouldn't, I mean, I don't think it takes a a, a rocket science to say, look, if, 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 if there was a nationwide network, if Dish had a nationwide network and we can talk about how they can get there, Mm -hmm. but would, would Apple embed connectivity in the iPhone? I mean, you got to be kidding me. Of course they would. I just went and bought my iPhone directly from Apple. Right. I have no interest in, in, in any customer interaction with AT&T. So now if they went to me and they said, oh, by the way, I see Mr. McDonald that you're, you know, a whatever level customer, we've given you a $10, you know, base level service. You can up sell that if you want, but like we've given it to you for free because you're a loyal blah, 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 you know, prime customer, Apple customer. So like, that's where it is going full mm-hmm. stop. Mm-hmm. So when I step back and think you asked the question, the provocative question, which is are their best days behind them, of course they are. Um, because the because if one were to build a, a wireless business today, you'd build it from the core out, you'd build it from the cloud out. I mean, everyone has been talking about with, you know, with, with great, you know, um, hope and trepidation, like when are the big tech guys gonna show up at a carrier auction? And I say, you well, know what? they did. They just, they just did, it's called Dish. Well, they did okay. uh, before Google was Alphabet, and then apparently um, got very nervous when it looked like they were going to be stuck for four billion. But then Verizon came in and got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I served on the board with Google at Clearwire. I can tell you that those guys are not—they're 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 not in the wireless business. Not even the cable guys aren't even in the wireless business. Wireless is wireless. It's hard. It's very bespoke knowledge. And so, you know, so so what you have is now you have. Amazon, who's got all of the underlying infrastructure, by the way, they, they're going to go all the way out to the edge with radios. They have a low capital cost. They've got incredible R&D. What do they lack? Right. Well, they, they lack yeah. spectrum, but they don't because they've got a partner. Yep. Um, and but in that partner being dish for those not, but it, it's, it, they have done a dance and there is a partnership, but have you been surprised there has been no formal lacking of the elbows there with Charlie Ergen, the CEO of Dish. Uh, no, no. I mean, I, I think Charlie Ergen will disclose what Charlie Ergen needs to disclose on the 10th of May in Las Vegas. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I, I I'm not privy to the to, to the ins and outs of, of of the agreement, but 
it, we spend a great deal of time trying to understand what's going on there. And you know, I, I suspect it's 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 a it's a lot deeper um, than than people understand. But it to to really understand why, you have to look and say, well, why would the cloud guys want to be in deep with him? Well, when you really talk to the cloud guys, they see machine connectivity like the processing of data around machine connectivity as being orders of magnitude larger than the current cloud compute market. And like, just put that in your mind for a second. Think about the, the, the terabytes of data that get like three, five, 10 terabytes of data. I've seen 20 numbers as high as 20 for, for an autonomous vehicle. That's got to get processed. Yeah. So it's got to get connected to the cloud. It's not going to happen in real time for a long time. But the point is that the cloud guys look at machine data and the manipulation and processing of machine data as like a massive market opportunity. And the, the impediment is connectivity and they do not want to deal with the carriers. And so therefore, what's the solution then for that connectivity? This, this idea of connecting all those clouds and creating industries where internet connected industries where there weren't any before. I mean, I certainly, that concept is showing up in business press. But I don't know that people inside the Beltway have an idea of what the hell that means. So I was wondering if you could elucidate. Well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of buzziness out there in mm -hmm. in, in in the world, um, you know. And, and I think we're still we're still early on in 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 what all of this will mean and how it will all come together. Um, you know, like, you know, it reminds me a lot of like the early 90s when, you know, when the, the, the early stages of the internet were going and people were, you know, hypothesizing about all sorts of things that would exist and virtual worlds and, you know, all of the, most of the things that we do now actually were talked about back in the early to mid 90s. Um, and then there was another camp of people who would say, hey, if you really want to be connected, there's a thing called Prodigy. There's a thing called CompuServe. There's a thing called AOL. And look, they're not that big. So why do you think this other thing is going to be bigger? So part of it is it's, you know, we're still early on in an, an entirely new economic architecture that it's 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 easier to throw around buzzwords um, and, and it's hard to make it tangible. But I'll, I'll just sort of give you one thing to ponder. Um, you know, it was within like the last year or two, but, you know, we, you know, you talk about in business and, and econ e e economists talk about things like called, you know, factors of productive uh, factors uh, of production, right? And you've got your land, you've got your labor, you've got your capital, um, you know, in China, they call it technology in America, they call it the fourth, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, China just added data as a fifth factor of production. Oh, well, that's interesting. And, and, and it's super interesting. Uh, it's super interesting because, because, you know, what they're saying is, 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 is the, the capture and manipulation of data is, is, is going to lead to, you know, entirely new forms of production and new forms of, 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 you know, of, of industry. You know? And what you're talking about here, Tim, is is in the industrial space. We're not talking about, you know, in right now anyway, what you're talking about is not, you know, the individual consumer type stuff that is all caught up in this privacy gnashing of teeth. What you're talking about is industrial, you know, cloud, so to speak, being connected and it happening at the industrial level, not. Yeah, I, I think topic. my own view is, is that um, part of what's happened in this country um, over the last 30 years and in a more pronounced way over the last 20 and even more pronounced over the last 10 or 12 is um, we, 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 we've been waiting for this architecture to get in place. I mean, we haven't literally because nobody's sort of been thinking this way, but like we, we've been coming to the end of the old economic model. And so we've been trying to wring as much juice as we can out of it. And, and we've been getting less and less juice because the model is less and less productive. And so what do you have? You have the Fed pumping money into the economy because we're like, 
you know, you're trying to get them off. <laughs> you're pumping them like, come on back, come on back. <laughs> when in reality, what we should have been doing is investing in these, investing in these new infrastructure layers. I mean, I remember back in 2008, 2009, Kevin Warbeck invited me to, you know, uh, you know, it would be it would be a lot to say I was part of the transition team at the FCC because I was like, hey, Tim, can you write us a white paper on X? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And I did. And I wrote a series of white papers around how to bring private sector investment into fiber deployment in the United States. And I levered my knowledge of fiber, fiber and toll road and a bunch of different things. And you know Tim, what? I didn't know you wrote white papers. I'm take, making a note. We no, like to I do don't, I don't, I don't, We like I don't. to do that at Georgetown. I you did, are you are on the hook. <laughs> I did. I did. I don't. I don't. I did I say white papers? You uh, did. So, I, I we're recording this. <laughs> but oh I apologize. I really should have seen that blinking, blinking red light. But no, I guess what I was gonna say is like so you know, it, it went nowhere. And and I think like gosh, you know, the federal debt was five trillion dollars in, in in at 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 nine eleven. The federal debt is twenty is the thirty trillion dollars today, right? Twenty five trillion dollars. If somebody like if you stood if we stood you know if we were on a on a call, like a, an analog call, in two thousand one and said okay here's the deal we're going to put twenty five trillion dollars of investment into this country to create the next generation infrastructure, like I think we'd be better off than we are now. But part of it is like people just didn't know they don't know where these industries are they don't know where to right. put the money so. I guess you know what what I what I'm saying is that we're still early innings, but we have been wasting a lot of our time and energy uh, focused on the consumer and consumption versus right. industrial and productivity. Yep. And part of the reason there's been that disconnect is the toll road wasn't finished. <laughs> you know, like the entire <laughs> right. platform wasn't in place. So you could you could have sat there in you know in the early '90s or late 80s and go, hey, you know what? The toll road's coming. I'm going to build this big development. You know, a lot of those guys lost money. Maybe they went bankrupt. And then other guys were like, see, it's under construction. I'm going to build this big resort. And it's like, yeah, well, good luck. And then all of a sudden it's there. And then things start to happen. And then you have the infrastructure in place. You have the systems in place. And we're actually there now where, you know, if one were to say, Hey, look, like, where are you investing, you know, in this country and in this economy to drive real productivity growth, real economic growth? I'd say, oh, yeah, like, you can see it in industrial connectivity, like in, in, in spades. You can see it in factory and factory automation. I mean, we have a we have an investment in a in a uh, citrus uh, farm in California, and we're at the facility I don't know, a couple of years ago and they have these like little optical readers that check the mandarins as they come in for quality control and they kick out the ones that are bad well like do you realize how much content and information flows through industrial america right. that if you had the means of capturing it and processing it in real time the the efficiencies that you could you know, mm -hmm. increase if you had a like a, a near zero feedback loop from the washing machine is turned on to, hey, you know, it's kind of running hot, you know, you know, you, you, you can take that to the extreme. You look in like in, you know, in, in hospital systems in America and, and the machines that they have and the, 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 the information that is essentially trapped inside those machines because there's no real way of 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 moving it inside of the hospital and you know now you've got companies that are like they're in the hardware business saying hey maybe we should be in the services business maybe we should kind of instead of sending our guy with that funky little machine that has to plug in and get the reader out of the you know radiology machine maybe that just connects in real time well there's a bunch of dependencies that that go into that so i, I would just i would argue that we are we are at the early stages now but 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 not super early that that now companies and industries can can start to apply this global compute platform that's been built over the last 25 30 years uh, to to real industrial America which you know by the way that's what creates jobs 
Right. That's what creates livelihood for the American people. You know, it's not TikTok. <laughs> and you have an issue yeah. with TikTok? <laughs> no, I mean, I really don't, but it was, just, it was the only thing that I could think of. But, you know, but no, but it's ben, just, I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. Go, 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 oh, ahead. No. go, go ahead. As we, a, I was just going to say you're a great thing. As we wrap up, I'm just curious in like a, what I'll call quick rapid fire round. If you're a great banker, so who is the um, who's the one building the highway? Is it in the is it Andy Jassy? I mean, which of the which of the players is it? Dish and Amazon there, and then who's sitting by the toll road eating bonbons and not paying attention to what's going on around them? Tim, we're all listening, and I'm poised to take uh, notes. No bonbons. I don't know. <laughs> like, I would say, first of all, um, like I, I have tremendous respect for Mike Siebert. I think he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. I think he's a very smart guy. Um, John saw that whole team. They're yes. very bright, but you know, they, they're, they're dealing with the hand they have, and they will dominate as you know, they will take share from the others uh, because they have a better spectrum position. And spectrum's a lifeblood of wireless. Yeah. Um, you know, a a a AT and T is like, you know, look, those guys are. You know they're 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 challenged, and you know I think they get it, and so they're going to make strange bedfellows, uh, and I suspect that they're doing that, and that's a good thing. Um, Hans, I don't know. <laughs> it seemed, seemed, seemed like maybe more eating bonbons based on what I, what, what I saw in that in that earnings call. Yeah. Now, um, my friends at Verizon are not going to be very happy with that comment. Um, I would just say, like, yeah, objectively, you know, the people that I would I would want to talk to. Uh, and, and and listen to um, a great deal um, with respect to to wireless connectivity and connectivity broadly would be uh, Andy Jazzy at Amazon, mm -hmm. um, Eric Schmidt, you know of, of Schmidt the former Futures, Google, right? right, formerly Google, and then you know Charlie Ergen, um, and I think you'd find those three would have broadly consistent views. Um, uh, of where this country is going, where the deficiencies are now. I mean, we could get into an entirely different conversation about about spectrum and 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 and, and licensing and auctions and mm -hmm. you know, there's a ton of really interesting stuff happening in the crypto like distributed wireless world. I think you know, it depends on the dimension of like innovation that you want to get to, but at the highest level of like, hey, let's talk about the future of connectivity for this economy and for this country uh i would uh, the first call i would make would be andy jazzy um and then i would uh, then i would then i would then i would talk to schmidt and 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 charlie ergen um they are you know they are uh they are on top of it and by, by the way like ergen's been on this i mean uh, uh schmidt has been on this for years mm -hmm. you know i mean he, he's like you know he He's a real believer because he sees how far behind we are on AI. He understands the stuff that we I kind of just touched on with data being like a factor of production, which by the way is lost on, you know, on, on Washington. It's like yeah, they don't even they don't even capture it in uh yeah, in terms of their Bureau of Economic Analysis. There's no metric that captures data in the economy. And it's something that several of us have talked about here in DC. Including well, it's you know, I'll tell you, I'll just put a plug in for a fellow Hoya. Uh, who's a who's a friend and a brilliant thinker, uh, Mike Mobison, um, and and Mike is um, is 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 a you know is a well well regarded industry analyst, financial analyst, you know sort of Buffett guy. He's written um, recently on um, you know the issues of intangible value in mm -hmm. the balance sheet and accounting. Uh, you know, um, frameworks. Um, and, you know, and, and that sort of scratches the surface of, you know, just the issues that we have as a country in terms of not thinking about data and intangibles um, in, in our economy. I think the, the recent report he did, I want to say, I'm going to pull it up here. He, he works for Morgan Stanley now. He publishes something called the Consilient Observer. And essentially, he, he was saying, like, if you did the adjustments that that, that they're recommending for accounting, that they estimate the earnings for the S&P 500 would be about 12 percentage points higher, higher with these wow. considerations. So, you right. know, maybe- And, and there are some others not, not nearly as brilliant who are suggesting that if you actually accounted for data, 
Um, you might have some more concrete explanations for why the economy on many levels appears to grow when, according to traditional metrics, it should be going in the other direction. But one question that has been bugging me all during the session is, is that a satellite phone I see behind you, Tim? No. <laughs> this is one of the classic bricks. That's one of the original <laughs> brick phones. Yeah. And I it, love it. Signed by Marty Cooper. Oh, that's oh, awesome. That's great. <laughs> so Mar Marty, Marty is a lovely guy. Oh, that's good. And I was, I was uh, uh, on the board with Marty in uh, his company, Raycom. Uh, back yeah. in 2004 plus, and so, so I picked up this phone years ago, and and I, I you know, was like catching up with Marty and Arlene in DC and something. And so I threw it in my bag. I'm like, you know what? I gotta have Marty sign that because that's <laughs> just legendary. And uh, most people are like, who the hell is Marty Cooper? Oh, that's a good. So like, you gotta Google Marty because you see yeah. that <laughs> shock of white hair. <laughs> Yeah. Just shows you how old they all are. Look, uh, Marty Cooper is an American legend. He is a gracious, absolutely uh, brilliant, brilliant mind, um, and a caring guy. I can't say enough nice things about Marty Cooper. I love the guy. Um, so that's where that comes from. I love it. Uh, we are a bit past our yeah. twelve thirty cutoff, um, as we often find ourselves because we have great guests. And I just that's wanted right. to say thank you, Tim for spending the time with us. What you're talking about is um, a fairly sophisticated and informed um, view. And I, I don't know that it's something that is typically talked about around you know, the cocktail circuit here in DC. So thank you for letting well, us bring this level of discussion. I hope I didn't ramble, but you know, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I am on, um, uh, on LinkedIn. I, I'm, I'm always happy to have follow-up conversations with folks um, because I do like connecting with folks and I do, uh, you can you can track me down on Twitter because I do I do get out there and, and say a few things on it's just TR McDonald at TR McDonald but I promise you it's not it won't won't, won't bore you but um, I've met some super interesting people uh, via both those channels and I'm always open to any conversation anytime. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tim. This was great. And for all of the folks who are still hanging on, it looks like we will reconvene our lunch nuggets for the Georgetown Center. Uh, Cent Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. I think we need to shorten it. It's too long. On May 25th, I believe, right? That's a Wednesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're probably going to continue a conversation with a mobile theme, probably around Spectrum, just given a lot of different moving parts in this space and a lot of important conversations that have to, ha that have to happen given the state of potential access to more Spectrum for any kind of player in this space. So tune in for more details. Thank you all very, very much, Tim. Thank Tim, you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. so much. Bye, everyone. Jen, it was great to see you. You too, Carolyn. Stay warm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.